Good morning. I want to welcome those who are here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church as well as the bigger audience we know that is watching on AFTV or on Facebook or YouTube or one of the different social media venues to our Sabbath school study. We're continuing in our study dealing with the promise, God's everlasting covenant. And today we're on lesson number five, and we're talking about the different aspects of uh, some of the covenants that God has made. And our lesson today is going to be dealing with the subject of the children of promise. And we have a memory verse, and the memory verse is from Matthew 28, 20. And if you have your Bibles, you can say that with me, Matthew 28, 20. It says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of of the world. Some of your versions may say, I'm with you always even to the end of the age or the end of the earth. But he's basically saying, I will be with you till the end. And uh, there's several promises in the Bible. You know, God told Jacob, I am with you. God told Joshua, I am with you. And then the culmination of the plan of salvation in heaven is when God is with us. Sin separates us from God. And so it's a remarkable promise when God reminds us, I am with you. I'm watching over you wherever you go. Now, uh, HMS Richard Sr. used to uh, teach uh, a fascinating, uh, he used an illustration, sorry, we got some spare parts on the podium here, uh, where a father, it's a true story, father and a daughter uh, went swimming somewhere on the East Coast, and it was a warm day, and the water was fairly warm, and it it was a calm day, and they went swimming out in the ocean. And they, they were good swimmers, and they went swimming out, and then all of a sudden, the father realized, as they tried to swim back to shore, the tide had changed, and now it was going out. And it went out with great force in this particular area. And swim though he might, he could barely get back in, and his daughter was with him, and if he tried to carry her back in, they just went out. So he had to make a pretty fateful decision. He said, listen, um, he told his daughter, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to get some help. The water's warm. You can float on your back all day if you get tired. I will come back for you. And she was used to swimming in the ocean, so she wasn't frightened by that. But he took off and left her, and she kept getting pulled further and further out. And he used all of his strength and just barely made it back in. Well. He notified a bunch of people in the village and several of the, um, the people in the town. They got their boats together and they went swimming and, or they went uh, paddling out to see if they could find the girl. And hours went by. Finally, four hours later, they returned where about 100 people had gathered on the shore with the girl. And when they picked her up, they said, uh, were you frightened? She said, no. She said, Dad told me he'd come back for me. And he said, you can float all day on your back. So I believed him. And so she wasn't afraid. You know, if you believe the promises and the covenant that God has made with us, it uh, goes a long way to give you peace. There's a lot of trials in life. And if you focus on the problems, you could live uh, a fearful existence. But God wants us to be people of faith and not fear. Amen? So we're going to talk about some of these promises God made. Take a look, for instance, in that first covenant promise, and you'll find this in Genesis chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. If you've got your Bibles, you can join me there. And we're going to focus on this. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through 3. Now, you remember we read that first promise in an earlier lesson that God makes in Genesis 12 to Abraham. And he kind of renews it here. When God first calls Abraham, you find it in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now we are in Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. God says, I am your reward. But Abram said, Lord, what will you give me? See, I, see and I go childless. And the heir of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring, and indeed one born in my house is my heir. And it says, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who has come from your own body shall be your heir. And he brought him outside. He said, Look toward the heaven 
and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. And he believed God and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's what you call righteousness by faith. He believed God and God declared him righteous because of his faith. Well, a few things to consider in this uh, passage that we just read. First of all, you notice that uh, God said, do not be afraid. Now, why would he say that? Do you tell somebody who is not afraid, don't be afraid? Or do you tell someone who's afraid, don't be afraid? Why was Abraham afraid? I mean, here he's called the father of the faithful. Well, think about this. He had come from Ur of the Chaldees. Now, just so you know, there is a discrepancy among the scholars where that was. Some have what they call the southern Ur, which is close to where the Euphrates River dumps off into the Gulf. And some have the northern Ur. There's an area in the mountains not far from Ararat that uh, also had the ancient name Ur that was inhabited by the people of Mesopotamia. So there's some discussion about where it was. But either way, so he comes from Mesopotamia. He crosses the Euphrates. He leaves his family, his people, his city, his town, all of the support structure, their culture, and they go to a strange country where people are speaking strange languages and they've got different customs and they're a little bit barbaric. Let me give you an example of why God had to tell Abraham, Abraham, do not fear. You remember, for example, when uh, Genesis chapter um, 12, in, in just uh, former chapters here, came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt during the time of famine, that he said to Sarai, his wife, she had not been renamed yet, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen that when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they'll let you live. Please say that you're my sister, that it might be well with me for your sake, that I might live because of you. <laughs> so he was in fear all the time. His wife was so beautiful. He was in fear that they were going to kill him for his wife. He's surrounded by nations that were, you know, they just... Remember, God destroyed the world because of violence in the days of Noah, or before the flood. And now things have gotten to almost that same point, where Abram said, these are a violent and a barbaric people. And so he was afraid. They're surrounded by seven nations that were greater than they were, even in the days of Isaac. So several years have gone by. Isaac tells Rebekah when they're going to stay with the Philistines, in, in, uh, in the area of King Abimelech, he said, say that you're my sister. Or they, said, they asked about Rebekah, and he said, oh, she's my sister, because he was afraid. That's what it says. He was afraid. So they're afraid. And one more example of this. Of course, uh, the sons of Jacob caused this problem. You know, Simeon and Levi got upset because the people of Shechem, the prince of Shechem, slept with uh, Jacob's daughter Dinah. And so Simeon and Levi went through and they sort of tricked the, the men of Shechem into uh, going through the rite of circumcision. And then Levi and Simeon attacked them, killed all the males, took all their, their livestock and their slaves. And here's what Jacob says. He said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious, odious, making me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me, and I'll be destroyed, I and my household. And so they kind of lived in constant fear of one nation attacking another. Why did Abraham have to rescue Lot? When Shedoleomer, the king of the north up by Damascus, he and a confederacy of other kings, they were really tribes back then, they came and attacked Sodom and Gomorrah. And so they were warring back then and attacking. So Abraham's surrounded by these barbaric, warlike people. And uh, you know, I didn't have to, had to wonder at night if they're going to take his livestock. And, and uh, it was a dangerous time. It was the Wild West back then. We call it the Middle East, but it was west of uh, Mesopotamia. And so God said, don't be afraid. I've called you. I'm going to watch over you. God had to tell Paul that. Paul went to preach in some dangerous cities. Paul said, no man is going to hurt you here because I'm going to be with you. I've got many people in this city. And so there's many times that God's servants have had to have reassurance that he's going to watch over us during these times. What else does he say? 
He said, do not be afraid. I remember hearing a pastor, a uh, little boy said, you know, he sometimes was afraid. And the pastor said, do you say your prayers every night? And the boy said, yes, sir. And he said, do you say your prayers in the morning? He said, no, sir, I'm not afraid during the daytime. <laughs> Just afraid at night. But um, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 8. What man is there among you who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let them go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. Fear can be contagious. And God did not want his people being fearful. And when Jesus calmed the sea, you know what he said to his disciples? Peace, be still. Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? You know what that means? People that are living in constant fear, they don't live by faith. I, I just finished a book on worry. I granted it's not the word fear, but the same principle. And uh, the reason I wrote the book is because I've met so many Christians that just live afraid all the time and afraid of everything and they're always worried and once they find they don't have to worry about one thing they find something else to worry about and nobody is one to your faith by your worrying people will be one to your faith by your faith if you are a person that has peace and some serenity people will be attracted to that because we're in a fearful world and so God tells us, Jesus said, where is your faith? Why are you afraid? Now, wouldn't you be afraid if you were in a storm in a little boat and the, at night on a dark sea and about to sink? And Jesus was not afraid. And he said, you should not be afraid. I know that sounds like a stretch. Do you know how Wesley was converted? Wesley was out doing missionary work in North America, trying to work among the Indians. And he didn't have very much success. And sailing back across to England, he was doubting his conversion when, during a terrible storm, um, all the sailors were afraid, and the passengers were afraid, except a group of Moravian primitive Baptists. They were up on deck singing, and they looked absolutely fearless. And Wesley was so impressed, he asked them. He spoke to the elder of the group. He said, aren't you afraid? This terrible storm, the boat was going down into the trough of the waves and waves were rolling over it. It was rocking back and forth and lightning was flashing. The wind was howling and, and everybody was afraid. Water was coming and the sailors were pumping and, and they were singing. I said, aren't you afraid? No, we're not afraid. Aren't your women and children afraid? They're not afraid. We're in the hands of God. You know, when we decided to follow Jesus, we died way back then. So now we're not afraid of death anymore. You realize when you take up your cross to follow Jesus, you die. And um, once you're dead, Christians just go to sleep. They don't die, right? So you don't have to be afraid. Anyway, I've got a friend that her husband was a little bit of a reckless driver. If they're watching now, they'll know I'm talking about them, but I'm not going to tell their names. And uh, he was you know, totally fearless. And she was fearful. Isn't it something how God puts those people together all the time in marriage? It's a part of God's cosmic humor that he takes those opposites. Somehow they're attracted to each other. <laughs> and every time he'd go around a term, she'd scream, oh, 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 <laughs> because he was, he'd be up on two wheels and he, he just always, was, he, he drove like Jehu. And uh, I finally told her one day, I was riding with him in the car and I'm watching this go on. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't it be easier, I'm talking to the sister, I said, wouldn't it be easier just assume that you're going to die and then relax? <laughs> I said, living in constant fear like this has got to be torment. Just accept, say, I'm going to die. And then just enjoy the ride. <laughs> and just, it doesn't make any sense to just be afraid and screaming all the time. It was this constant terror. And so for the Christian, you know, just accept, well, I'm going to die. Enjoy the ride, right? Live by faith. Anyway, God said, don't be afraid. And then he makes this other statement. He says, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Let's talk about the shield part here for a minute. Um, if you look in uh, oh, Psalm 144, verse 2, God is my shield, the one in whom I take refuge. Uh, that's a picture of uh, like when you can read in Ephesians, one of the implements of the Christian's armor is the shield of faith that you hold up and you quench the fiery darts 
of the enemy when Satan is hurling his doubts and his temptations at you you hold up that shield they just deflect they don't touch you and God protects us I like the picture it gives in Psalm 91 verse 4 it says he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will take refuge his truth will be your shield and your buckler so you picture you know when the hen gives a little chirp of warning and all the chicks run underneath the wings and there they're shaded and there they're protected and the mother's ready to give her life to protect them God says I will protect you under my wings and you'll take refuge God is your shield now if you've got God as your force field if he is your protection then is there anything that enemy can do to hurt you you have nothing God said no one's by the way Abraham did make it he died of old age God protected him through his life through all the trials and adventures that he had God said I will protect you it's amazing with all the adventures that David had that David managed to die in his bed of old age essentially and he says I'll, I'll take care of you I'll protect you don't be afraid I am your shield and he said and I am your exceedingly great reward now when you think about the reward of the Christian do you think about heaven do you do, or do you think about God so many people I think about heaven they think oh, a world no more pain new body no more aches and pains no more sorrow no more tears I'll be able to fly soar to worlds unknown I'll be able to eat from the tree of life to my full never be hungry again never be thirsty again and people go through the litany of wonderful things in heaven and all of that is true but what is the greatest reward of heaven God himself will be there and we can be with God the real reward for the Christian is when you love Jesus and you think about heaven you're thinking about being with the one you love that will be your exceeding great reward to be with your Creator and your Redeemer all right let's go to the next section here it's the messianic promise messianic promise and there's two parts to this this is part one and you read here in Genesis 28 part of God's covenant for his people also your descendants will be as the dust of the earth and you will spread abroad to the west and to the east to the north and to the south and in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed now that is really a uh, that's a promise and a prophecy that has multiple you might say manifold different ways that it could be fulfilled first of all the Jewish people Christians in the world today two point one billion 2.3 billion somewhere in there and a lot of people are classified as Christians they're born in the Catholic Church or they're born in the Anglican Church they may not be practicing but they are categorized as Christians Muslims of course you've got both devout and you've got secular Muslims they're about 1.7 1.8 billion Jews do you want to guess 16 million, 16 million. That's good Luke it's not that many I mean you think they've been around a lot longer than Muslims and well, of course there's been several times in history that have been virtually annihilated or exterminated but um, about 16 million and so when he said your people will be like the sand of the sea was he talking about Jews or was he talking about Christians or maybe both because every Christian what does the Bible say if you read in Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise so the promise that God made to Abraham your descendants are going to be like the stars and like the sand that would also include not only literal Israel and uh, you know even back in the days of Solomon when he dedicated the temple and David he said you know you've made me king over your people that are numberless and um, so God had fulfilled that promise back then he made them a great nation back then but uh, even beyond that uh, you can read here in Genesis 1818 since Abraham surely shall become great and a mighty nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him how you know you think about the greatness you can think about the numerical quantity there's a lot of Christians and Jews in the world billions they fill the world um, why does it say in your seed all the world will be blessed you know the word seed means descendants it's sort of the Hebrew way of saying your offspring um, how 
is all the world blessed in that offspring. Through the seed of Abraham, the Messiah came, right? But another way you might realize that, how do you have the Bible? We're all sitting here today because of the book. You know, I'm, I'm glad that we found an acronym for this facility, or I should say these facilities, namely the, the church, the Amazing Facts office, the warehouse, all that happens here in the studios, and we call it the Word, the Word Center. And the Word, in case you don't know, that's World Outreach Revival and Discipleship. Everything we do here is because of this book. Would you agree? Everything we believe, it's the foundation, it's our constitution, it's, it's the, you know, the uh, Magna Carta of what the Christian believes. It's the, the ultimate source. Jesus is called the Word. How did we get this book? This book is the history of Abraham and his people. It is all written by Abraham's people. In thee and in your seed, all the world would be blessed. If it was not for the Jews, the world would not have the Bible. With the exception of a, a small excerpt in the book of Daniel written by Nebuchadnezzar that was inserted, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had his dream in chapter 4 and he writes that section. The whole book is written by Jews. In Abraham's seed, all the world is blessed. Part of the job of the Jewish people was to announce and introduce the Messiah. They did that at Pentecost. And in addition, they delivered the Holy Scriptures. Uh, Paul says, for to Israel were committed the oracles of God, the sacred oracles, the law and the prophets and the Psalms, through Abraham's seed. It wasn't all written by Jesus in person. It was written by the seed of Abraham, right? So there's a few ways that this prophecy was literally fulfilled. And, but the ultimate way is that the Messiah would come through the genealogy, the line of Abraham. Now, there were several forks in that tree. You know, you've got... Uh, not every Hebrew is a Jew. I saw something on the internet when I was studying last night. It says, Jews, Hebrews, Israelite are all the same. That's just, sorry, they don't know their Bible. That's categorically not true. Uh, Jews, the word Jew principally means people who have descended from the tribe of Judah because 10 of the tribes were carried away by Assyria, but the tribe of Judah, which was the biggest tribe, and Benjamin and Levi, they were carried off by the uh, Babylonians, they did come back. The Assyrians never really allowed the Jews carried off or the Israelites carried off by them to come back again. And a Hebrew, technically Abraham was a Hebrew. The word Hebrew means those who have crossed over. Um, that would mean all Muslims are Hebrews. It is true Jews and Muslims are both Semitic. That means they came from the tribe of Shem. That's where you get the word Semitic. But there are differences. The descendants of Jacob, Israel, are the Israelites, the 12 tribes. The descendants of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, they're typically called Jews. But yeah, if you're, you can find people from Manasseh or Issachar, you can call them a Jew too. Everyone will sort of know what you're talking about. All right, that was probably more than you needed on that. Now, can you be a physical Jew and not a child of Abraham? Let me read something to you. John 8, 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And later he says, you're not Abraham's children, you're of your father, the devil, because you're doing the works of your father. So when it talks about the seed of Abraham, it's not just talking about physical genealogy, DNA. It's talking about those who have the spiritual DNA and what was the real trait? What was that identifying marker in the DNA of Abraham? Abraham believed God. These are people of faith. Amen? All right, so you've got that uh, first pr promise and there's many prophecies we could look at where it talks about the Messiah would be coming through the line of Abraham and we know that that was true. Not only did it tell us that the Messiah was going to come through the line of Abraham. Further on, it says it was going to come through the line of Jacob. Then again, they come through the line of or Isaac, then the line of Jacob. Then Jacob says that through the line of um, Judah, the Messiah would come. Did I put that verse in my notes? Yeah, Genesis 49, verse 10. 
The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. And a little later, he not only narrows the focus more, starts out saying, you know, it's going to be through Shem, and then through Abraham, and then it's going to be through uh, Isaac, Jacob, and then it's going to be through David, or Judah, then David. And the, the last uh, marker given is that it's going to come through the line of David. And then, of course, both Joseph and Mary came from the line of David. All right, moving on. The Messiah promise part two. Now, there are a lot of promises in the Old Testament that talk about the Messiah's coming. Uh, some of them are talking about the first coming, and some of them are talking about the second coming. Let me just say this, um, because you've, you've probably heard me say it before, but I, there's always people listening who haven't heard it. The devil confused people regarding the prophecies of Jesus coming so they were not ready for his first coming. Some prophecies talked about Jesus coming loudly like a lion. Some talk about him coming meekly like a lamb. The nation of Israel thought the first coming of Jesus was going to be loudly like a lion, but they were wrong. They misunderstood the prophecies, and when he came quietly, they said, we don't understand. We thought you were coming like a conquering king, and you were going to overthrow the Romans, and you were going to reestablish the, the Davidic dynasty and the kingdom of Solomon, and, and when he came and he's dying on a cross, they said, this was not at all what we pictured with the king coming. Don't look like a king. And they got the prophecies mixed up. Now what's happening, and so they were not ready for his first coming. Now what's happening is the same thing. They say he's coming secretly, quietly. People are going to disappear. And life's going to go on, and we're going to go through seven years of tribulation. No, now when Jesus comes next time, he's coming like a lion. And he's going to roar, and it's not going to be a secret. And they're confusing the second coming, preparing much of the Christian world to be deceived by a false Christ. So the devil always does that. He tries to flip things over. He says they call good evil and evil good and light dark and dark light and the devil wants to just get it all mixed up. So now we're dealing with the promises of the second coming of Jesus. Do you find in the Old Testament promises about the first coming? Yes. Do you find, and, and let me see, what are some examples of the first coming? Well, Isaiah 53 is an example of the first coming of Jesus. Do you find in the Old Testament prophecies of the second coming? Or are they only in the New Testament? Don't be afraid to answer. Worse it could happen is you'd be wrong. <laughs> yes, there, there are prophecies, many prophecies in the Old Testament of the second coming. And that's why they sometimes got it mixed up. Here's just a couple. You can look in Psalm 50, verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire will devour before him. It will be very tempestuous all around him. And he will call to the heavens above and the earth that he might judge his people. Gather my saints together. That's where Jesus is. He'll send the angels to gather together the elect from the four ends of heaven. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Look in Job 19 verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand at in last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I will see God. That must be second coming, because you're talking about the resurrection, glorified body. Whom I will see for myself, and my eyes will behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. So there are several prophecies in the Old Testament. You can look in, in the book of Joel, and the book of Amos, the book of uh, uh, Ezekiel, and, and I mentioned Jeremiah. A lot of prophecies of the second coming in the Old Testament. And of course... In the New Testament, all the prophecies of his coming are the second coming, or when he comes at the end of the millennium. Uh, Jesus said, John chapter 14, 1 through 3. Here's one of the plainest ones. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you might be also. And then, of course, Revelation 3, 12. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out no more, and I'll write on him the name of my God, and the name of, uh, the name of uh, my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, 
which comes down out of heaven from God, and I will write on him my new name. God talks about that new city and uh, the many prophecies. In fact, if you read in Matthew 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 21, these are passages where the disciples just said, Jesus, tell us about your second coming. What is the signs of your coming? What's going to happen in the end of the world? He gives them a very thorough discourse on some of the events dealing with the second coming. So there are multiple prophecies. You can read there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise. You can even read in uh, Daniel talking back about the... Um, second coming in the Old Testament at that time Michael will stand up the great prince that stands for the children of thy people and there'll be a time of trouble such as there never was and a resurrection many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake so you can find many prophecies about the Messiah's second coming in the Old and in the New Testaments um, and then he, he makes a promise that uh, Abraham would be a great and a mighty nation did God keep his promise that Abraham would be a great and a mighty nation? Let's read something here. Deuteronomy 4, verse 6 through 8. Therefore, be careful to observe them. He's just recited the Ten Commandments. And uh, actually, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is just before the Ten Commandments. Be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes. Others are going to hear about my laws. And they will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and an understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all of his law which I set before you this day? You know, God's plan was that as missionaries fan out around the world and you teach the Word of God, that the different nations will say, wow, these are just really logical, just, and righteous laws. And if society followed these laws, you would have a lot more happiness and peace. Now, it is true. And you'll often hear from, you know, modern media today and the history books that these you know, missionaries went out and they were all violent Jesuits that told people either believe or die. Uh, that did happen some. That didn't always happen. There were a lot of good missionaries, yes, and there were a lot of even gentle ones from uh, Catholic and Orthodox churches that went out. A lot of Protestant missionaries, they didn't say believe what we tell you or die. They lived among the people. They taught them the Word of God. They learned the language. I've been reading some great books on missionaries. William Carey and Hudson Taylor and others and the incredible work they did. And you know what happened? People that had never heard about Christianity, they said, this makes sense. It resonates as true. These are wise and just laws. The reason that Christianity spread around the world is not because it was all done by force. It's because they were good laws. Matter of fact, most of the governments in the world today their basic statutes of law have been adopted from the laws of Moses and no matter what country you go to today it seems like after a while they end up going uh, over to the, um, the, the, the state of law that is basically founded on the laws of Moses and they're, they're just laws um, that you treat people differently if they did not know something then if they do know you're more culpable that's why in America you've got first degree murder, second degree, third degree murder. If it's premeditated murder, you're more um, liable and the punishment is more severe. All that's in the laws of Moses. And um, the laws regarding inheritance and property, so much of that traces to the Bible. Good and just laws. Laws about take care of your neighbor. If their donkey wanders off, bring it back, even if you don't like your neighbor. It's the right thing to do. And so. These are the, basically the wise laws that make for a happy society. By the way, we're starting to get away from that now. Um, how much time do I have? You probably heard me say before that, um, you know, we have one group in North America that is kind of pushing that if it's anything religious, we need to get away from it. 
the tri they call it the separation of church and state. Anything that can be found in the Bible shouldn't have the Ten Commandments posted anywhere and we shouldn't uh, be enforcing anything based on what's in the Bible because that, that's using religion. Now that's not really um, what the writers of the Constitution believed. The writers of the Constitution were a religious people. Even deists, some of them were deists, are religious. They believe in God. And you look at the writings of the Founding Fathers, they all unanimously believed that these laws would only work among a religious people that were self-governed, that had certain morals. Uh, if you expect the government to solve all the problems with new laws, most of the problems that we have in society are from people with bad hearts. It's not because we don't have enough laws. If our hearts were changed, we would not have half the problems we have. You missed a good amen. That, that one, there was a great opportunity there. Just no, it's too late now, it doesn't count. I had to tell you to do it. I have to tell you to do it. But Roger Williams came along and he said, uh, you know, you need to make a distinction. He said, you know, I would hope that everybody would want to keep all 10, but as far as the government's concerned, there does need to be a separation. You separate the two tables of the Ten Commandments the way that God did. One is more civil in nature, one is more purely religious. The first four commandments deal with our worship of God. It defines who God is and how to worship Him and when to worship Him, what His name is. The government should never make laws telling people, this is when you should worship, that's important for us, right? We should be free to choose. Or what His name is or how to worship Him, so forth. So, but he said, the government must enforce the last six. Parental rights, the sanctity of marriage, that marriage is between a man and a woman. Notice it says, uh, love your, honor your father and your mother. It's pretty clear that there's only supposed to be one of each, and they're not the same. And uh, the rights of property ownership, government doesn't own everything. You have the right of property ownership, your house, your land, do not cover your neighbor's possessions. When a government stops to support those things, it begins to unravel, and, and pretty soon, um, you got kind of a totalitarianism, but anyway, I don't know how I got on that little rant, but it feels better now that it's over with. So going to a great and mighty nation, that's where we were, Joshua 21, 44. Did God keep his word? Did they become a great and mighty nation? Joshua 21, 44. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. And the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hands. If they've delivered all the foreign nations into their hands, they've become a great and mighty nation. Not a word, I love this verse, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. Now what's the title of the lesson? It's talking about the covenant of promise. Did all of God's promise come to pass that he would bring them into the promised land and give them victory? He did. He, God keeps his word. He is the author and finisher of your faith. You must believe that if you let him, he will finish what he started in your life. God finishes his work if we follow. Jesus said, follow me. The children of Israel, as long as they followed God, he brought them into the promised land. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. What nation is there that has laws that are so righteous? And then, finally, he said, and I will make your name great, was God's promise to Abraham. We're still expanding on Genesis chapter 15. He said, I'll make your name great. How did that happen? He also says this in Genesis 12, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. What does it mean to have a great name? Does it mean to have a long name? Like uh, Evil Marrow Doc or Zaph Baph Benia? Or I'm trying to remember, there's, so, there's another, I think there's some Egyptian pharaoh who had a really long name, but I can't say it. He uses every letter in the alphabet. Is that what it means to have a great name? Have a great name means that you've got a great reputation with the name. The name of the Lord is great. Why? Because he is a great one. His name represents who he is. When people think of Abraham, they think of his great faith. Now, he deserted his country at 75. He lost his name there. You start out new. If you move to a new town, nobody knows you, 
you're starting from scratch. You got no name. I've moved to new towns before. I go to the bank. I want to open an account. And they said, you got any credit? And I said, no. And you got anyone here who will co-sign for you? I don't know anybody. He said, well, then you're nobody here. No, you have no credit. Nobody knows you. So Abraham, starting out from scratch, God says, don't worry. You're going to have a great name before it's over. The word Abram, the definition is a high father, a father of height or an exalted father. That was a good name. But then God later changed his name to Abraham. What does that mean? A father of a multitude, a father of many nations. And God changed his name to Abraham before he had any children. Now, that must have been awkward. Here he is, you know, 75, 80 years old, and he marches into a new territory of the land of Canaan, and he meets some of the people there. And, Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? What's your name? Abraham. Oh, father of many nations. So how many children do you have? None yet. But I'm optimistic. How old are you? 75. <laughs> and so he, he did end up with a great name. Abraham means father of multitude. Now, how many people are there in the world right now? Just under 8 billion. It changes every moment. You realize that. But there's under eight, just under 8 billion. Roughly 50% of the people in the world today claim Abraham as their spiritual father. Think about that. All the Muslims, Jews, Christians, even people of the Baha'i faith and others, they trace back the great inspiration of their faith. I emphasize the word great inspiration to the name Abraham. Someone who loved God so much he left everything to follow God and put his son on the altar. I mean, you got to he put his past on the altar when he walked away from home. He put his future on the altar when he put Isaac on the altar. Abraham trusted God completely, and God made his name great. Now, Matthew Henry writes in his commentary, His name is great among the Jews, whose descendants boasted having Abram for their father, and among the several nations of the world. His name is famous in a secular history, even among non-Jews and Muslims. And it is in high esteem with the Muslims, especially among, especially is his name great and famous, and the memory of him is precious among all those who have obtained like precious faith, every Christian, out of every nation. You know, God makes a promise. He says in 1 Samuel 2, 8, he raises up the poor out of the dust, he lifts the beggar from the dunghill, and he sets them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory. God can take people that are nobody and make them somebody. Amen? And gives them a great name. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place in which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. That took courage and faith. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. He had great faith. That's why he had a great name. Anyway, finally, the Lord gave him rest from all the nations around and made them as the stars of heaven, as God promised. I want to remind our friends before we go off the air, uh, we do have a free offer, and that free offer today is Saved from Certain Death. It's a wonderful story of salvation by faith. We've been talking about in our lesson today in God's promise, of His uh, covenant promise, you can get a free copy of this by simply calling 866-788-3966. That's 866-STUDY-MORE. And we'll continue studying His Word with you again next week. Now, if you are just joining us, if you were not here last night, you may not be aware that this morning is part of a series that is going on this entire week called The Seven Deadly Myths, Myths in Christianity. And uh, this is something we hope that you will be bringing your friends to. We have flyers out in the hall. Scott, you came out too soon. I haven't introduced you yet, but you just may as well stay there. <laughs> we got flyers out in the hall. We hope that you will take a few of these and share them with your friends. And uh, I would like to introduce Scott, our speaker this morning. Scott is the president and speaker for Belt of Truth Ministries, professional school teacher who went into full-time ministry, has a remarkable testimony. I'll let him share more about that with you. 
He's very popular and sought after at uh, youth conferences and events, has a great, uh, few great series of programs on uh, media and its effect on our culture. And uh, in addition, he has uh, a one wife and three children. And uh, they are with him this week. And we're just so thankful to have Scott Ritzma and his family with us and uh, ask for God's blessing on him. Would you like to say a hearty amen to welcome him this week? to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. God bless you, Scott. Thank you, Pastor Doug. I am so grateful to be here. Thank you for the music, young people, and all the smiling faces. I am so filled with joy to be in the house of the Lord on the Holy Sabbath day, aren't you? Well, last night we got off to a quick start with a study of myth number one. And those who were here know what myth number one was and how the Bible needs to be the foundation for our lives. And, and not just the Bible, but a true belief and trust in the Word of God. Not a theoretical thing, but something that reaches the heart. Not something where I pick and choose, but a what we call fundamental belief in the Word of God. You remember Pope Francis and a couple of years ago came out and said that to have that fundamental view of of the scriptures, he said was a bad thing. And we said, well, wait a minute. What is the definition of that? And it is taking the scriptures at face value. The very definition of the Christian faith. We also saw that it was only 19% of Christians who say in the surveys, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my savior, made a personal commitment to him that is important in my life today. Only 19% of that group believe in some basic, basic questions like God is the all-powerful creator, Satan is real, you can't get to heaven by your own works. There were a number of questions we looked at and you go, wow, the Christian church is really struggling, hence seven deadly myths in Christianity. You hear popes and, and surveys of Christians saying things that boggle the mind and we're going, where has the foundation gone? And then we're going to get six more myths in, in 10 meetings, because some of them take a couple of meetings to go through. This message is entitled, Unmasking the Deadly Deceiver. And I want to say something right out of the gates, that this one is foundational, because this will impact everything else we study. So you'll want to come to all the rest. Last night's was good, and it was important. Catch up on that one when you can, but don't miss any more from here till the end because they build on each other, particularly starting with this one. So if you know some friends, get them online, watching, listening to these very important messages. What we need to know as we approach the last days. Well, actually, maybe the better question and phrase is who we need to know. Because Jesus is the truth that unmasks the deceptions. Jesus is the way and the life that prepares us for his soon coming. So with that in mind, can we have a word of prayer as we begin the message? Bow your heads with me, please. Our loving Father, as we open your word, we want to see Jesus. We want to understand truth. And we want to see this deadly deceiver unmasked for what he is, that we might escape the snares of the enemy, that we might know that we are walking hand in hand safely with our Savior Jesus heavenward. And so we ask for your presence to speak, set aside all of our ideas and the speaker's thoughts, and we just want to hear your voice this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, myth number two tonight. I encountered this idea a number of years ago in a quite boggled the minds, you might say, is this even a popular idea? God himself has orchestrated the development of evil, pain, and suffering. He is responsible for it. Believe it or not, this is not only a misconception and a misunderstanding of those who are, you know, more or less ignorant of the word of God, but this is a school of theological thought that is taught, that is believed in out there, that God is somehow the originator, the orchestrator, the divine puppet master of evil. So let's ask some questions this morning. Where did evil come from? Why was it permitted to develop? And why is it still here? And you're going, Scott, how are we going to do that in just one hour? That's going to be impossible because these are questions that have per perplexed the minds of thinking people who've pondered philosophical ideas and big thoughts and things that touch close to the heart about our own pain. How are you going to do that in that amount of time? Well, Lord willing, we'll get a few glimpses out of the Word of God, but I have to give one more mention to those who are viewing online, 
put your email address in at deadlymythsbook.com, free book that's going to be released this summer to anybody who puts their email address in. I see some people doing this in-house. I want your attention, students. Don't get on your phones now because there are some yellow notebooks that are actually going to be passed around for the in-house audience. You can write your email address down. You're free to do that, too, on the, on the web form. But everybody whose email address comes in this morning, we're going to send a free book of the whole Seven Deadly Myths series, plus a lot more that we are not getting to, because you noticed last night we were kind of short on time, got cut off, and I had to cut a lot out, amputating, excising large portions of things that we would love to deal with, but time constraints, so we're going to finish it up with the book. So as those, as those notebooks are passed around, you can just pass them back and forth and then send them forward. There will be a notebook in each section, and those who are viewing online, put your email address in at the website. So last night, we raced through some pretty important content, also establishing the credibility and the validity of the Bible. We looked at the historical event of the resurrection. We looked at archaeological, textual understandings for the, the, the really the most well-attested, historically accurate and reliable history of the ancient world is the New Testament writings. And so, again, if you missed that and, and we had to race through it, we're going to expand on that in the forthcoming book, free book. We're going to study this morning, th not a story. I was, I was about to say we're going to study a, a story of how this world came to be the way it is today. But it's not a story. What do you think I'm about to say? It is the story, the one true story. And usually with this story, we begin in Genesis 1, and you like the, the words, you love how that starts when, you, when, it's, when it sounds, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you read through that creation account, and you go, wow, this is beautiful. A perfect earth, perfect people, a perfect God, a perfect place, and the creation was celebrating with singing. Did you know that there were some beings singing about this? Because you, you imagine a world with no deception, with no death, with no depression or debt or divorce or any other horrific D word you can come up with. And you go, that is a beautiful thing, something worth singing about. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, the Lord asks in Job 38. When he laid the foundations of the earth, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay, wait a minute. This is before Genesis chapter 3, where there's a serpent. Before we get there, can we just hang out here for a moment? The perfect creation that God made was something worth singing about, wasn't it? And that's what's coming again in the future, by the way. The new earth, Eden restored. We get to experience that ourselves. It's not just history. It's not just the opening chapter in the story. It is the last chapter in the story, and it's a chapter that continues forever. So what are these stars that we're singing? You know, the Bible uses symbolic language. We understood we want to take a literal, real face value interpretation of the scriptures as we read it. It speaks to us. We don't form it to say what it should say, in our opinion. That was from last night. Stars. Do stars literally sing? The Bible always interprets itself. I want you to turn to Revelation 1. This is super, super helpful to understand who exactly was singing and praising God in this opening act of creation. In Revelation chapter 1, you see in verse 16, he, Jesus, had in his hand, in his right hand, something. Seven what? Seven stars. Now jump over to verse 20, and the Bible will tell us when we read about the stars singing for joy, who these stars represent. It says, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this. This is verse 20. The seven stars are the what? The angels. Stars represent what in the Bible? Angels. So the Job verse, when you laid the foundations of the world, the angels were singing for joy at the power and beauty of God. Don't you wish we could just stop there? Because we're like, holy pair in Eden, Adam and Eve, walking with Jesus in the cool of the day, the, 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 the fruits of the tree of life, and a serpent in Eden. Eden. Wait, wait, wait. Where did this serpent come from? 
How did he get there? Why is there a Satan? Well, there's a prequel to Genesis 3 with the serpent. You know where the prequel is? Turn to it in Ezekiel 28. If you're not familiar with the term prequel, this would be the opposite of a sequel. Instead of something that comes after, it is something that goes before. What happened before a serpent ends up in the Garden of Eden? Ezekiel 28 tells us about who this being is that was in Eden. Now, when you start reading this text, you see this is a lamentation for the king of Tyre. But the prophet Ezekiel is not speaking only of the king of Tyre because he starts to pull back the veil and speak of, of the evil spiritual entity that is actuating the king of Tyre, the evil being behind the king of Tyre. In verse 13, you were in Eden. Ezekiel 28, 13. So was the king of Tyre in Eden <laughs> thousands of years before? No, he was not. So this is about the evil being behind the king of Tyre. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. That's musical instruments. If you grew up watching TV, you're well aware that Satan is a musician. The musical instruments, that's a whole other seminar in media on the brain. We won't get into that right now. But the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, this was when he was a beautiful musician in heaven. It was prepared for you on the day that you were, what's the next word? Created. Okay, so he's not an eternal being. He was created at one point, and what kind of being was he? Read in verse 14. You were the anointed what? Cherub who covers. A covering cherub. Have you ever seen the imagery of the Ark of the Covenant? You've looked at that recently at Amazing Facts. With the two angels covering and, and being there in the very presence of God. That's what it goes on and says here. I established you in verse 14. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of what? Fiery stones. Our God is a consuming what? Fire, Hebrews 12, verse 29. You've heard of the burning bush and the fiery chariot. Fire in the Bible representing the presence of God. The Shekinah glory of God has the two covering cherubim. This, this angel that we're reading about right here, this cherub was right there next to God. In verse 15, though, it doesn't stay that way. It says, you were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created. So did God make a holy, pure, perfect, to quote the verse, angel? He did. This we're going to see in, in a moment. He's named Lucifer in Isaiah 14. We'll go there in just a second. But he says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was, what's the next word? Very important word. If you're in the habit of underlining in your Bibles, Iniquity was not inserted into Lucifer. Iniquity was found in Lucifer. In fact, jump down to verse 17. It says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom. You corrupted your wisdom. His own thoughts. He's inventing a new concept called iniquity that was found in him. It's not God that's responsible for this new idea, this new principle of, well, lifting yourself up. We're going to see that in Isaiah 14. Let's actually turn right there. But you corrupted your own wisdom, he, his own nature. This, this holy angel, this covering cherub, had a perfect nature that God created him with. And then he corrupted his own mind and iniquity was found in him. You're going to Isaiah 14. Let's look at verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O... What's the word there? Lucifer, that's the name that he was given. That literally means light bearer. Ah, like a star, right? Like a star bears light. So here he is as an angel in heaven, a covering cherub. <clears throat> but it says fallen. How you are fallen. We have a fallen angel here, don't we? As many people have heard of this concept of a fallen angel or they don't quite know where Satan came from. Here it is. It's the story right here that is the prequel to him being a snake in the garden because he was up in heaven as a holy angel and then now it says you are fallen. How did he fall? Verse 13, 
for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my, what's that next word? Throne above the stars of God. What are the stars again? The angels. He says, I'm going to have a throne and I'm going to rule all the other beings. It says, I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Whoa, whose throne does he want here? The throne of the most high God. Who do you think you are? He's a created being. And he wants the position of the most high eternal God. You know, if you were to sum up sin, iniquity that was found in him and define it, in the most succinct way, iniquity is the self-promotion, self-exaltation, or maybe you boil it down just to selfishness. The root of all sin, the, the definition, the source of all sin, the heart and core of all sin. He's saying, I will ascend, I will be above the others, I will rule, I will take the position of God. Philippians 2, by the way, has Jesus doing the opposite. Have you ever noticed that? Where Lucifer said, I will ascend, I will ascend, I will rise above, I will be above the clouds, above the other angels. Jesus, being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be clung on to, but made himself nothing, taking the form of human and a servant and becoming obedient to death, even death of the cross. That's the opposite character. That's when I say I want to be Christ-like, it's not in the sense of Lucifer, I want to be like the Most High and have his throne. I want to have the, his humility, and I want to be Christ-like with that same character that's selflessness. So you see the two principles now at war. I will be like the Most High at the end of verse 14. So what does the Most High receive from his throne? Well, he receives the worship of his throne. His subjects, his created beings. He receives the obedience of his created beings. So that's probably what Lucifer is looking for here. He wants that throne of God. Go to Revelation 12, verses 7, 7 through 9, and we're going to see a little bit more about the nature of this rebellion that he staged in heaven, where he said, I'm going to take the throne of God. Revelation 12 calls it a war. And He's going to actually recruit other angels in his war in this text. Let's read it in Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Now, the Bible uses symbolic language. Which is this, this dragon, you might wonder, okay, what, is the, what does the dragon represent? We could guess, and we could go, I think it represents China. You know, or No, let's not guess. Let's always go to the word of God as our authority. Verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. Ah, you see, the dragon is the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So, back to verse 7 now. The war broke out in heaven. The dragon fought, and the dragon and his angels fought. Wait a minute. He's got angels on it? Satan's got angels on his side? Where did, where did they come from? Well, read in verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. One-third of the stars. What are stars? Angels. One-third of the angels are on his side here. His tail, metaphorically speaking, draws them in to his rebellion, to his ideology, to his deceptions. Then, verse 9. Or let's read verse 8 first. But they did not prevail. Praise God nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. By the way, that's why we're doing the seven deadly myths, because deception is the full-time job of the enemy in these last days. He's also the accuser to discourage us. He's the tempter. These are his main gig for this time in Earth's history, where he has, knows his time is short, and he's coming down with great wrath to deceive the the whole world. That, we'll come back to that in a future session as well. But he was cast to, I'm at the end of verse, verse 9 now, he was cast to where? To the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So now you've seen the prequel, haven't you? Why is there a serpent in the tree? He was cast to the earth. He had staged this rebellion in heaven, got a third of the angels on his side because he sought that self-promotion of, I want the throne of God, I want the obedience and worship of the angels of heaven. Now he's on the earth, and you know that story in the Garden of Eden. 
did God really say that you will, and he plants doubts in Adam and Eve's mind about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So his controversy, his war, his conflict that he began in heaven is taken down here. Can I get humanity on my side like I got a third of the angels? Can I get Adam and Eve? Did he get them? He did. He tempted them into sin. They fall. The fall of humanity happens in Genesis 3. Satan rejoices, but the story doesn't end there, does it? God promises a redeemer. He says, there will come a descendant of Eve who will crush the head of the serpent. Isn't that good news? Now, this story is absolutely critical for us to understand when we are asking these questions about the origin of evil and what God is responsible for in all of these perplexing questions that people ask. A number of years ago, I was confronted with this idea, this notion that God's will, since God is all-powerful, his will is deterministic, meaning everything that God wants to happen will happen, and everything that happens happened because God wanted it to happen. God's will determines everything, and everything that happens was God's will. So that becomes a problem for the thinking Christian, because what about human trafficking, child sacrifice? I mean, we could go on and on with all the dark things of this world. Is that God's will? Preposterous notion to even question and ask. The Bible says the angels also had a will, didn't it? It says you corrupted your wisdom. Lucifer made a choice, didn't he? He corrupted his own wisdom and iniquity was found in him. Found in him. Not God putting it there deterministically. How about human beings? Do we have a will? Well, gladly, we don't have to speculate, we don't have to wonder, we don't have to theorize, we don't have to form opinions. The Bible says it straight out in Luke 7, verse 30. It says the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves. And the context of that was having not been baptized by John the Baptist. So did you hear the underlined part there? It is possible for a human being to reject God's will for them. That's absolutely critical as a foundation for understanding God's character because God is sovereign. He has all the power that he could ever have at his disposal. He speaks worlds into existence. He is sovereignty. He is sovereign. He makes the calls, right? He's the king. And in his sovereignty, he has declared that we shall have a will and that we can choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. Have you read that verse in Joshua 24, 15? He asks us to choose him. Lucifer rejected him. The Pharisees also rejected the will of God for them. God's will is not deterministic in the sense that he has declared evil and pain and suffering. It's the will of sinful mortals like the Pharisees. It's the will of angels who joined in the deception. And I'm sure you've noticed evil people do a lot of evil things with their pervert, perverted wills. Have you noticed that? Maybe you have a past. I do. And I go, what was I thinking? We've noticed we look around at horrific things that people do with their free will that God has given to them. They make choices that grieve the heart of God. If somebody hurt you or hurt a loved one, that was not God's doing, his will, anything that pleases God. Satan was delighting in that. He was tempting that. He was encouraging that. God's heart was breaking with the person suffering, the person in pain, the person a victim of something. God, his love for us is infinite. It is infinitely empathetic. And you think about the, the feeling a parent has when their child is hurt. We're God's children, and he has way more love for us than we have for our children. How much pain does he feel? Now, if you think about it, if God's will was always done, then wouldn't everybody be saved? Because the Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish. So how many people does God want to perish? None. He wants all to come to repentance. If God's will was always declared to be done in a deterministic sense, then everybody would be saved. Because <laughs> he, that's what he wants, of course. 
He wants everybody to repent and be saved. It says it also in 2 Timothy 2, verse 4. God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He want, he's not, his will is that nobody perish. And we can form opinions. We People do that. Like we become theologians and we listen to theologians and we form opinions about what God's sovereignty means and We'll just let the Word of God say what it means. It means He desires and wills, and His will is that everybody be saved. And as you notice, not, not everybody will be, as you've read the Scriptures about the second death and about the punishment of the wicked and about the broad road to destruction. Many Scriptures indicate that we will not have everybody choosing God and His salvation, His free gift of salvation. It's offered to every soul. You can have it right now for the taking. Jesus' sacrifice was for every person. You might say, but I'm one of those who's had a perverted will and has victimized others. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think I read that somewhere. And that he is kind to the wicked, it says in Luke. Jesus, the Father, gives, gifts, gives his Son to those who are enemies of him. That's you. Now, you might say, well, why doesn't God just then coerce the will, force the conscience, make everybody choose him so that there isn't anybody who's lost and victimized and captive to Satan? Well, we're going to get to that shortly, but sometimes it's better to just go, you know what, I don't need the why. I don't need for God to explain himself to me. I trust. He's shown himself enough. It's kind of like parents. Sometimes the kid comes like, why such and such? Sometimes parents explain it, and sometimes they go, because dad said so. Because mom said so, right? You know our wisdom and our love, and you trust, right? So we could just end it there, but I want to explore this further, because there are certain, there's, there's one text that people will raise and be like, God created evil. It says it right there in Isaiah 45, 17. God creates evil. Now, if the Hebrew of Isaiah 45, 7, 7 says literally that God is the author of evil, the inventor of evil and iniquity, then we've got a Bible that contradicts itself because it says iniquity was found in Lucifer. It said he corrupted his wisdom. In Matthew 13, Jesus says with regard to, to evil in the world, an enemy has done this. God takes no responsibility for it. So what does that mean in your King James? This is the Old English, which is translated from Hebrew and means something in our modern language that the other Bible English translations get absolutely correct. It is calamity, disaster for a nation who is rebelling against God. God brings punishment upon particularly his nation, Israel. He sent the northern kingdoms to Assyria. He sent the, the Ju Judah to Babylon. And so God will bring calamity, disaster. And why, why would he do such a thing, you might say? Well, it's still kind of like a parent who sometimes, like, your kid gets out of line and is rebellious toward mom and dad. Like, we're, we're going to need to bring some calamity to wake you up here. It's out of love. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Revelation 3, verse 19. God loves those he disciplines. And Hebrews 12, 11 says the reason he does this is not for evil. It's for the opposite. It says, now chastening now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Like, you don't enjoy the punishment, but it's painful when you're being punished. When you're being disciplined is maybe a better word for it. But it says, nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of what? Of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God brings calamity upon Israel to bring the fruit of righteousness. It's, it's the opposite of evil, isn't it? So God doesn't create evil. The Bible says he is the, in him is no darkness at all. God is light. Now, you might be wondering, does that mean like every disaster that comes in the world or every terrible thing that happens in our lives is like God bringing it and bringing discipline? Not everything, because there was a time where a man was born blind. Do you remember the story in John chapter 9? And the Pharisees said to Jesus, all right, who's, who's sinned? Who's getting punished here, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And do you remember what Jesus said? He said, neither, neither. Because we just live in a fallen world, don't we? There are consequences of Adam and Eve's choice that afflict and affect everybody. And it's not God doing it. And it's just the devil's made a mess of this planet. So back to what happened in Eden and how he made a mess of this planet. Remember Satan first sought that position of God in heaven 
which the, the throne of God, the prerogatives and privileges of that are the worship and obedience of the subjects of heaven. He wants that on this earth now. He says, can I get the obedience of Adam and Eve? Can I get them on my side? He even sought the worship of Jesus. Let's fast forward to Matthew 4. All these I will give you, he said. All the world and all the kingdoms of this world I will give you, he said to Jesus, if you will fall down and, what's the next word there? Worship me. Satan is absolutely obsessed with receiving worship. He's still on that quest he was on in heaven, even though he got cast out and his war failed up there. He still thinks he can get the worship even of the Son of God. His entire mission of deception seems to center around this quest to receive worship. In fact, all of the heathen religions, every false religion out there, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I say that the things which the Gentiles, or the heathen, the pagans, sacrifice, they sacrifice to who? To what? To demons and not to God. This is why the first two commandments in the Ten Commandments are about worshiping God, having no other gods before him, do not have idols in our lives. It's because Satan wants to worship unto himself, and if he can get our attention off of anything other than God, he's succeeded in his quest, hasn't he? Because every Gentile or pagan religion, when they're offering their sacrifices, they're doing their worship ceremonies, Paul says they are worshiping demons because God is being withheld. His worship is being withheld from the rightful God. In the last days, go to Revelation 13 with me. In the last days, there's a, an entity upon the earth that's referred to as the beast power or the Antichrist, which we will study in a subsequent session. But I want you to see what the agenda of Satan is through this emissary of his, the Antichrist. You're going to notice a word repeated three times. And if you were here last night, threes are special in the Bible. They represent an emphasis. When you see holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, I won't repeat them all, but many times in the Bible you will see a threefold emphasis. When something repeated three times, it gets our attention, including Mark chapter 13, be not deceived in the last days. Take heed that no one deceive you. People will do signs of wonders and deceive the very elect if that were possible. So deception is a serious thing, as we started with last night. Now, what is the devil's goal here in verse 4? So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And then in verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There's that lamb again. This is really about Jesus being the true, the true God of the, that we worship. Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This says Satan is trying to supplant the position of Jesus. He wants the worship, doesn't he? The dragon, the beast, the beast power, the antichrist power. If Satan can get worship unto that, then he's gotten his goal. So go to 2 Thessalonians 2, and while you're turning there, I, I, want, I want to show you something here on the screen. You've seen a number of news articles like this where overt Satan worship is gaining ground in our society. This kind of thing is absolutely dark and disgusting. It's, it's terrible that there are children that they put on that and that image, looking up to Baphomet there. But I want to mention that as, as horrific as that is, and we should call it out and call people to Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and say every person, even somebody who's been a Satan worshiper, can come to the cross, and he, your name can be written in the book of life from the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But that kind of thing is only going to appeal to a relatively small sector of society. What you're going to see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is how Satan casts his net of deception very wide here. It says, let no one deceive you by any means. I'm in verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin... This is a reference to the beast power, the antichrist power, the, lo the lawless one, the little horn, is revealed. The son of perdition, remember that, we'll come back to that in a second, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So you see the conflict is over worship. So that he, this, this antichrist power, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He wanted that position in heaven, didn't he? Satan did. He's going to have his agent 
be in the very temple of God. What is the temple of God in the New Testament? We'll study this in a future lesson. It is the, the Christian church. He's going to claim to be God in the midst of God's people as a son of perdition. Now, John chapter 17, verse 12, uses that phrase, son of perdition. And do you know who it's in reference to? Judas Iscariot. So, what was Judas Iscariot like? He was in the midst of the twelve. He was a fraudulent disciple, wasn't he? That's what this Antichrist deception is going to be like. So when we hear Satan is seeking the worship of all the inhabitants of the world, it's not just through pagan, heathen sacrifices. It's not just through Baphomet. It's through this thing that looks Christian like a son of perdition in the very temple of God, which is the Christian church. Verse 7. This is his agenda here in a nutshell. For the mystery of lawlessness, that's one, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the second time I've seen the word lawless there whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. I hope during this series we are receiving not just the truth, but the love of the truth. You see the difference? It's not a mere intellectual assent to acknowledge the actuality of the scripture, the truth in the, of the matter. It is a truth that transforms. And we love the truth and we won't be deceived because we love the truth and we cling to it. And Jesus is the truth. And our relationship with Jesus is number one in our lives. But the devil is seeking to take down God's law. Did you see it repeated three times, particularly in your New King James, captures this very well. The lawless one, the lawless one, the lawless one. So Satan seems to not like God's law. Are you catching that? Well, of course he's lawless because he wanted his own law. He wanted the position in heaven, didn't he? So you see in Daniel 7 the same thing. We're going to study that. This Antichrist power thinks it can change the very law of God. So there was war in heaven. The war continues all the way down to the last days, as you see in these prophecies in Revelation 13 and in 2 Thessalonians 2. The war is Satan's lawlessness versus God's law. God's rightful authority to receive our worship and obedience Satan's fraudulent claims to overturn God's law and receive the same from people. So if so, if this is the real conflict, then what will be the heart of God's people? It will be our, our desire is to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we're not going to let the devil get anything, any foothold in our lives. In fact, Paul says, know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Now, why did I underline that part of the word that says serve there? Well, Paul just said, the one that you obey, you are actually serving. Now, what does serve mean in the Bible? Have you read in the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, thou shalt not bow down to thyself, Thou down thyself to them, nor, what? Serve them. What does that mean? That means worship, doesn't it? Let my people go, Moses said, that we may go out and serve the Lord in the desert. What are we in right now? A worship service, right? So to serve the Lord in the commandment, in the second commandment, is to worship him. And Paul just said in Romans 6, 16, that whom we obey, we are serving so obedience is really the highest form of worship, isn't it? That's a beautiful thing. Are we obedient to God? Because the devil is seeking to overturn that. If Satan can get people obeying him or his antichrist rather than God, then he has actually succeeded in receiving worship. Remember this concept for a future session that we're going to touch on because this is foundational. If Satan can get people obeying him or his antichrist rather than obeying God, then he has succeeded in receiving the worship of people who do thus.
Well, then what will the last days people be like? The dragon was enraged with a woman, this is the church of God, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the what? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Blessed are those who do his what? Command was that just three times again? The book of Revelation three times says that God's last day people will be eschewing Satan's deceptions, avoiding his worship, worship, worship that he seeks, and will be the commandments, the commandments, the commandments at the heart of God's people's desire to obey him. Now, did you notice the part about the faith of Jesus? That goes back to last night where the majority of Christians surveyed thought that they could get to heaven by their own works. No, Jesus' merits alone and his righteousness alone are what, what grant us salvation and an entrance into the city of God. Never forget that when we talk about commandments. And we'll deal with that issue of, the, of God's law and grace and salvation in, in a future session. But here we are looking at this grand story, this great controversy. And it brings up this problem of evil question. If God knows the future... If God is all-loving and God is all-powerful, then people have posited the question, why then not just destroy Satan at the beginning? He started his rebellion. We understand he had a will. He had that, that, that idea he invented in his own mind of iniquity, of self-promotion. Well, right after that, why didn't God just end the rebellion? Have you ever wondered that? Well, we could just go, I just trust God. I don't need, I don't need an answer to that. The wonderful thing about God's word is it gives us so much to go on that we don't have to have any doubts, any, any lingering, I don't know if I can trust Jesus with my life. I don't know if the word of God is, is worthy of my confidence. Never, because there's so much there for us to go on. So let's ask this question. After Satan rebelled, did God have enough power to cast him to the earth like a pebble? I mean, he, he speaks worlds into existence. He could have gone poof and the devil's gone. Has God proven his love to us in Christ at Calvary? There's no doubting his power or his love. So there's no if in the equation. If God is all powerful and all loving, then why? There's, he's already proven it. There's no if about it. But just to entertain the idea for a moment, imagine this. The Lucifer, Lucifer this, 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 he's Satan now, the adversary, he's got a third of the angels listening to his lies, his whisperings, his rebellions, and he's recruiting them, as we saw in Revelation 12, verse 4. And what is he saying to them? What, you can imagine, well, we know from John 8, verse 44, that when he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. Have you ever read that? So, like, if his, you, you know he's lying if his mouth is moving, right? He's lying to the angels. And who's, whose throne does he want again? The throne of God. So he's lying, therefore, of course, about God himself. And these insinuations, these doubts that sound a little like the thing he said to Eve, did God really say, you know, you can't trust him. He's holding out on you. He's pulling back what real pleasure you could find if you eat of this fruit and you can be like God. He's being selfish, a tyrant to hold on to his position. You can have Godhood too. You can imagine the same thing said in heaven as he said to Eve. So the rebellion has sprouted. The angels are hearing the rumors, or at the very least they have questions. And they're wondering, is Lucifer... Sa They've never heard anything like this before. They've lived in eternal bliss from the moment they were created. And wait, Lucifer's always been good. And he's right next to God, and God is good. They're wondering. They have questions. Now imagine that another message comes in, an announcement from heaven to all the angels... Lucifer was just destroyed. Let's use an analogy to think how that would land in the minds of these intelligent people, angels with a will and a heart and mind and conscience. Okay, the analogy goes like this. A White House aide comes out to the media and he says, I have some disturbing news for you. That you're, and he's fabricating a lie about the president of the United States. And he says, the president is not who you think he is. And I'm going to hold a press conference tomorrow and spill all the beans to tell you the real truth about him. And I'll give you some little hints and juicy things. And then, okay, then the next morning, right before the press conference is to start, this White House aide is found dead on the banks of the Potomac. 
Uh, this isn't looking very good for the president, is it? It's looking kind of suspicious. So God knows doubts have been insinuated into the minds of these angels. A war has begun and accusations have been made against God. So amazingly, the God of heaven, the sovereign, the all-powerful, almighty God is in a position of being assessed, being judged, as it says in Romans 3 verse 4, let, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words, that you may overcome when you, capital Y, when God is judged. God is being judged and assessed for is his character the way that, it, that, we, that we know it is. Well, I'm hearing all these lies and deceptions. God says, I'm going to vindicate my, my character. In Revelation 16, verse 7, and in Revelation 19, verse 2, the announcement is made, righteous and true are your judgments. God's character is vindicated in the end. And every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord in the end. But in the meantime, as amazing as it sounds, as incredible as it sounds, the God of heaven is in a position of waging a disputation with Satan. His character has been assassinated, and he is going to vindicate his name, his law, his authority, his position. And, of course, Jesus proved it all at the cross. Now, why not just crush the rebellion and just say, serve me or else? He has the power. He has every right to do that. Why not just crush it immediately and say, serve me or else? Well, the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. God is a God of freedom. Why is God a God of freedom? Have you ever read in 1 John 4 verse 8 that God is love? And you can't have love without freedom, can you? There's no such thing as forced love. Have you ever thought about that? You can force compliance. You can force outward obedience. But you can't force Love. Let me use romantic love as an analogy here. A number of years ago, in November of 2002, I took a liking to this young lady that I had been courting for some time. Her name was Cammie. And I said, I want to marry her. She's here in the audience with my family right now. And so I had this idea. I'm going to have Song of Solomon open. I'm going to get down on one knee and I'm going to ask her to marry me. And I did it. And now, I, I, I didn't have this thought. Now, what if she says no? I'd better have a backup plan. <laughs> so I decided to conceal Carrie. And I said, will you marry me? And she, this is not what happened, of course. So oh, I don't know, honey. Uh, I don't know if we're ready. I don't, I don't think I can. Well, you will marry me or else. <laughs> right? I didn't do that because any love that was in the room at that point would have been extinguished in a heartbeat because you can't force love, can you? And I didn't want a Stepford wife either, if you remember the old 70s concept of the robotic wives. You can't love if you're robotically programmed. That's how evil arose, because Lucifer wasn't robotically programmed to do what God wanted him to do. God says iniquity was found in you. He corrupted his own wisdom. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Love the Lord your God, right? With all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The greatest commandment in the law, Jesus said. God wants our loyalty. He wants our worship. He wants our obedience as an expression of our love to him. He wants us to love him. That's the number one thing. And there are certain things, my friends, that God cannot do. You might be like, how can you say that? There are certain things God cannot do. It says in Hebrews 6, verse 18, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. It says it also in Titus 1, verse 2. There are certain things God cannot do. He cannot lie, and he cannot force love, can he? So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's God's sovereignty that declared that, not, my, not our own ideas or our own theories. But if he rules by coercive force in heaven, not only does it betray his character of love and freedom, but then the angels are serving him out of fear, like, is he going to squash me? And what, what does that produce? Is fear, are fear and love compatible? No, perfect love drives out all fear, John says. Now, the Bible also says, fear God and give glory to him. What kind of fear is that? Respect, awe, admiration. 
to, to give him the glory that he deserves as the almighty God. But he also wants us to love him, not to be terrified of him. So Nahum 1 verse 9 says, affliction is not going to arise a second time. How does God make sure that he ends this rebellion, ends evil and pain and suffering in a way that guarantees that it won't arise again? Have you ever wondered that? Turn to Matthew 13. I've, I've wondered that because we know God's going to destroy evil and pain and suffering and Satan's going to be destroyed. We know that from Bible prophecy. Well, how is Satan, how is God going to make sure that nobody ever comes Lucifer 2.0 in the future? All right, I'm going to come up with an idea too. He's going to make sure it doesn't happen and we're going to see how and why. Now, by the way, this myth that we are studying tonight, that God is somehow responsible for and orchestrating evil and pain and suffering, this is a deadly, deadly myth for one central reason. And that is we are saved by God's grace through faith. What does faith mean? It means trusting him. And if Satan can get into our heads a distorted picture of God's character, a view of him that is not accurate, a view of him that is dark and distant, a view of him that is uncaring, that delights in pain and suffering, is that a God that is easier or harder to come to in trust and faith? It's harder. Satan wants to make that gap between us and God. God says, I'm going to come near to you. So the reason we're dealing with this big philosophical concept is not just for prophecy and the future things we're going to study, understanding obedience and worship in God's law, but it's really about our relationship with God. Seeing him and his love and coming to him in trust. Now, Matthew 13. This is an amazing parable. I love this parable. And we're going to do it backwards, okay? Because Jesus tells the parable and then the disciples are left going, uh, we don't understand it. Explain the parable to us. We're going to start with his explanation where it tells you all what these different uh, parts are of the parable. And then we're going to go back and read the parable. So we're going to start in verses 36 to 39. And you're going to collect a few different identifiers here that are going to appear in a parable. You're going to hear about field, a field and wheat and tares and a bunch of things. Let's read it. It says in verse 37, He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. So, okay, you got that one? The good seed represents the son of the man. The one who is sowing the good seed represents Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares or weeds are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. You're going, Scott, I'm not going to memorize all these. We'll review them as we go back through. And then the reapers are the angels. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. The enemy is Satan. The field is the world. The one sowing the good seed is the son of man. The, the, the good seed is good and the evil seed is evil. Now let's read the parable in verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. So the Son of Man, Jesus, sowed good in the world. But while man slept, his enemy came, Satan came, and sowed tares, or evil, among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So you have a world with good and evil in it. Jesus sowed the good, Satan sowed the evil. We've already covered that. We're clear on that part, right? We're asking the question now, why is it lasting so long? Why, is, why are we still here? And how is God going to make sure this sin doesn't rise again a second time? So let's, let's see what these workers say, the servants say in verse 27. They came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Isn't that the question people are asking? God, you're all powerful and all loving and you're the author only of good. Why is there evil then? And his answer is, an enemy has done this. And that's what we've covered already. The servant said to him, a reasonable question. Do you want us to go and gather them up? Can we, can we be done? Can we be done with our limited mortal minds? We're just going, let's just end it. Let's just you know, wrap it up thousands of years ago right away. Well, he says no in verse 29. Don't go and gather up the tares. That, that perplexes people. That why? Why? Why, God? Why all-powerful, all-loving God? They're asking the same question here, and he explains it to them. He says, no, 
lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, the end of the age, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then go to verse 40, and you read about, then he throws them in the fire, it's the end of the age, and lawlessness will be weeded out of his kingdom, and the righteous will shine forth like the sun forever and ever. So did you hear he said, don't pull the weeds yet? They're still small. We've got weeds and wheat, and if you pull the weeds out when they're small, when they haven't grown yet to the harvest, then you're going to pull up the wheat with them. In other words, you, with your untrained minds, can't necessarily discern clearly early on in this process what is the very root of evil and good. You're going to make some confusion there. If we end this thing too soon, people are going to go, what? I, I, I don't know. I don't understand. Wait, I thought that was weeds. Wait, I thought that was wheat. By the way, scholars tell us that there are weeds in the ancient Near East in this context that did look like wheat. So that's kind of interesting, the connection there from the, the historical context. So it makes sense to us, though, doesn't it? Sometimes when you're growing a garden, you see little things, you're like, is that weed or is that weed? Or is that my crop that's just sprouting? But when they're bigger, so he says, wait, 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 because there is, a, there is an ingredient from the equation that is left out. When people say God is all-powerful and all-loving, and if he was, he would destroy the evil now, and therefore I'm going to be an atheist. Well, hold on, you left an ingredient out. God is also all-wise. And he is going to make sure, because he is all-powerful and will destroy evil, and because he is all-loving and doesn't want it to arise again and cause more pain and suffering, he knows the future, and when the time is ripe, I was going to say when the time is right, but do you see the analogy? When the wheat is ripe, and the weeds have displayed their horrific, ghastly uh, evil, the, 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 the horrific nature of evil is being manifest so that in eternity future, nobody looks back and goes, yeah, I don't know if God was right in that. No, just and true are your ways and your judgments. And then the universe is secure forever because God didn't do it too soon. Now, by the way, we ask God the problem of evil. How could an all God? You know what? The Bible says that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the world and then the end shall come. And in 2 Peter 3, verse 12, it says we can hasten the second coming by living holy lives. So wait a minute. You're telling me that God should be asking us that question, shouldn't he? If we were preaching the gospel and growing up as the wheat into the holiness and the stature and the measure of the fullness of Christ, then we would be hastening the end. So why are we still here? It's not God's fault. And I'm not trying to blame. We all need to look in the mirror. God could very well ask us that question, couldn't he? Now I want to give you the ultimate answer to the problem of evil. It's right there, pictured on the screen. You might have all the philosophical, theological, biblical texts and, that we've studied, but when it comes down to it and somebody looks you in the eye like somebody did to me once and said, Scott, you're a Christian. Why did my daughter just die in a car accident last night? Why did God do this to her? I wasn't about to get this whole study out and go through all the intellectual stuff. And I said, you know Jesus. She was a Christian. She was faltering in her faith. And I said, you know what it says in Isaiah 63, verse 9? It says that in our affliction, God is afflicted. And that's all you need to say during those moments. I would love it if everybody was fortified with this study before hard times. But if we have only 30 seconds to say something as we close today, it is Jesus is with you in your pain and he endured it. More pain than all human suffering combined. Jesus took it at the cross. Do you trust him? You know his word is credible. We've seen that last night. He's died for our sins. Give your heart fully to him as we close in prayer. Lord Jesus, here's our heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your commitment to us that you came to this world to prove your love and that we can trust you now with our lives. We pray that you'd give us a deeper walk with you as we see your character, that we might trust you and know that you are our Savior. We want to know you, for that is eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, my viewer. Welcome to 2CBN Television, 
My name is Lydia, presenting today's poem to CBN, Saving Souls. Proclaiming the three angels' message in this media technology age, reaching out to all nations, that is our main mission. Bringing hope to the world by sharing God's holy word, shedding light to all souls, turning souls into Pauls. While the enemy surely tries to use media against God's cause, with the word of truth we rise, teaching men to love God's laws. To CBN, through television and internet, and volunteers ready at work to spread the gospel, we are set. Please remember to subscribe and click that notification bell and like and share.